<laughs> hey, what is going on, crypto people? Wow, what an absolutely crazy time to be an early adopter of this new asset class that is a digital asset space. So I don't know, was the crises averted? Was the crisis averted? I don't know. Did we shut down or not? Like, I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. Cash flow is still up. But did, did we shut down? I have no idea. Anyhow, listen, we're going to go with the market <laughs> because the market is doing what the market does. Looks like it responded a little bit to the news. That's what it's looking like. Listen, I'm going to talk a little bit about RWA, real world assets, and the tokenization of real world assets and why I believe more so than ever that old, old money doesn't want you to win. Why are we still living in the world of accredited investor is just beyond me. Listen, I, I was just listening to Robert Kiyosaki. I may share this video with you guys as well. I probably will. It answers a lot of things. But uh, when I shared a story about Rihanna, what she's doing <laughs> with her stuff uh, for her fans, it's groundbreaking. But Rihanna can do it because, you know, Rihanna is not your average Joe and Jane. <laughs> right? right? She's up there with the B. Yeah, like uh, another, you know, <laughs> another B. You know what I mean? The billionaire, baby. Interesting stuff. I'm going to share a couple of stuff from X with you guys as well. My guy, Taiki, uh, look, I think he's just on it uh, for sure. We'll talk about that uh, in another video about the risk-free weight risk-free weight. We have to bring this T-bills on blockchain. It will change the game if the U.S. can get out of its own way. But that, God knows, that's still left to be said. We'll, we'll still have to find out about that. I'm going to share this guy with you here. His rent, this guy's name is Ram um, Aluwalia. I saw him on um, Real Vision Crypto. I wanted to share with you. He has some very, very interesting thoughts. This video here from Jenny Johnson is 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 uh, really, really, really powerful. Is it here? Let me see something. It's really, 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 really powerful. I'm going to share that with you as well. Interesting stuff. Some food for thought because we just got to think. Why don't we have access? Why does it? Why doesn't the average Jane and average Joe have access? Right. The, the promise of tokenization of real world assets, the promise is to be able to allow the everyday investor to be able to participate in things like what Rihanna is offering. Take a listen to this. I'm going to go through this real quick. The token. No, let me go with the numbers real quick. Let me just apologize. The total cryptocurrency market cap is at one point one five trillion. <laughs> Isn't that still sideways? Isn't isn't Bitcoin trading at $27,951 still sideways? Uh, yeah, it is. The Bitcoin dominance is at 47.3%. Ethereum is trading at $1,729. And XRP is trading at 52 cents. Nothing to see here. Absolutely nothing to see here. So let's go over uh, Rom's post here. Tokenization and a creator economy, economy need updated regs to unlock the promise of NFTs. When David Bowie securitized, David Bowie securitized future royalties from his song catalog in 1997, selling Bowie bonds or Bowie bonds to, is it David Bowie or Bowie? David Bowie? Bowie, I think. David, I don't know. To raise $55 million, it was a groundbreaking financial innovation. Few artists have leveraged their creative works in such an asset-backed way before. Now in 2023, Bowie, I think it's Bowie's, pioneering idea, idea, <laughs> holy moly, uh, pioneering idea may be ready for a new iteration using blockchain technology. Modern creators have an opportunity to tokenize their songs, films, shows, and other work. They could issue crypto tokens that represent fractional ownership rights to future earnings from their catalogs. Fans could invest directly in artists' success, essentially crowdfunding projects and sharing financially on the upside. Now, recently, Gary Gensel put a kibosh 
to fans every day hooking up with multi-millionaire actors and creators just recently, right? Just recently did that with, uh, with the uh, XRP guy and his wife. I forget their names now. Put a kibosh to it. Because the average Joe and the average Jane was going to be able to potentially benefit. Right? They That couple, they didn't put something out for accredited investors. They put it out. They, they, they came up with a way to give access to their fans. And Gary Gensler put a kibosh to it. Platforms like Royal allow musicians to offer tokens tied to streaming royalties, giving fans transparent stakes. However, outdated aspects of copyright and securities laws pose barriers to tokenized crowdfunding going mainstream. Regulators limit certain public offerings to credited vetters, investors only, shutting out everyday fans and uncertainly around how smart contracts and blockchain rights should be treated under IP laws stifles innovation. Thoughtfully modernizing these policies, modernizing these policies could enable creators to tap into crypto enabled finance while protecting rights and in investors. If done responsibly, tokenized crowdfunding represents a triple win. Creators access, access upfront liquidity without giving up ownership rights. Fans get unprecedented access to invest in artist career. Meanwhile, Chase Bank UK is telling people what they can do with the money, what they can and cannot buy. Brutal. Absolutely brutal. Take a listen to this here. This uh, is Rom again, but I'm going to listen to Jenny Johnson. This is what he says. The future is tokenized culture. Franklin Templeton's Jenny Johnson nails it at CNBC, delivering alpha. Tokenization equals securitization on steroids. Tokenization of culture IP via NFT royalty streams. Rihanna is creating modern era Bowie bonds. David Bowie. Yeah, I guess it's it. I used to live in Bowie, Maryland, or near it. So that's why I'm saying that. For fans that can consume, promote, and share in the upside. Athletes, creators, and their fans is the fastest path to digital asset adoption. But if we got Gary Gensler in the, in the helm, he's not going to let the average everyday fan participate. But take a listen to Jenny Johnson here. It's around a lot of things like FTX and others. But if you if you bring the technology down to its, its core value, it does three things. One is it, um, it allows a payment mechanism. Number two, it allows smart contracts to be programmed into the token. And three, because it's a general ledger, it has a source of truth. So whoever has that token, all rights in that token are, are granted to that person. So if I sell it to Frank, I don't have to go through a third party to do it. Frank gets it and Frank gets all the rights. So my favorite example is Rihanna, who uh, came out with, right before the Super Bowl, she, and I know she's just testing the market in this, 300 NFTs, each one worth 0.00033% royalties of one of her biggest songs. There's a lot of zeros there, but does it matter? Only 300 NFTs, but royalties, royalties to the fans, 300 NFTs. But you're going to get to 0 0.0003 royalties. Well, why can she do that? She can do it because when Spotify plays a Rihanna song, it can capture the smart contract executes and says, I owe royalties here. Uh, so nobody has to be involved in it. And it can take the fractional payment and go to, because Frank's a big Rihanna fan, so it goes to his account and he, he owns a couple of those. <laughs> uh, and, and he's paid, right? So now think about any way in which you have uh, revenue streams or royalty streams that you can now start to fractionalize that or democratize that and think about how that is an uncorrelated asset to all the traditional assets. So other examples is, you know, I think that athletes are going to, they'll sign a big contract, they'll say to their fans, I'm gonna sell off 
you know, tokens worth 10% of my future revenue stream. I'm going to, you know, 100,000 tokens and boom, uh, the fans are going to probably pay a premium for it. So it will be a way, if you think about it, it's just securitization done on steroids. And it's merely that this technology is enabling it. And it's also it enabling other very interesting companies that will disrupt some of the traditional business models that we have today. There it is. <laughs> the, dis the disintermediation is a big deal. This dude kind of lays down some stuff that'll have you fund or some stuff for a bit. Don't know who he is, but I want to share this with you. Check this out from this guy. Very, very smart guy. It's an OMC conference. Uh, to EMC. Richard, uh, give you a, an opportunity to push back with the counter argument. FMC. Thanks, Marina. <laughs> About pushing back. You know, the I think the current market technology, what the banks and financial market uh, participants use today, is at end of life. The biggest risk is status quo. Hearing arguments for nothing to see here and move along, what we have is sufficient. I work with these banks. I work with these market participants. They've done everything they can to, uh, you know, performance engineer those platforms to support the level of market volume that they can. Large banks spend $10 billion a year or more on technology. My gosh, that's, that can't be the most efficient way to deliver a technology infrastructure. What you've heard up here uh, over the last few minutes has been about decentralization in crypto. And my clients are in a post-crypto period. This has nothing to do with crypto. This is not about decentralization. As I said in earlier comments, the view is that there's a role for intermediaries uh, you know, in this future architecture based on a Web3 technology stack. And it's very attractive to the, um, the market participants because of the end of life of current technology, because the current technology is what's opaque, corruptible, high cost, rigid, very fragile. We've seen that in consent orders to the largest banks around resilience. When a bank has a wires outage for a couple of days and the OCC issues a consent order to fix that, and that bank has to spend a billion dollars to do it on current tech. Gosh. Current tech's awesome. Seems to really be working well. Let's not change a thing. <laughs> the highest risk is status quo. With regard to your keys, your crypto. In the crypto world, which I'm not talking about, but if I was to comment on it, code is law. In the application of a Web3 technology stack by regulated institutions, it's law as law. When you tokenize a real world asset, a sovereign currency, real estate, a bond, law as law. It's less about custodying the private keys as it is about servicing that asset like you would a traditional asset. So, you know, many of the arguments that, uh, that, that you may have heard or the perspectives, I would say, no, actually there's not arguing, but the perspectives, there's a, a, um, a chasm between what's really going on with the banks who are investing in building tokenization platforms, private networks, with the, with the expectation that those private networks will be connected through public networks to create a network of network once the functional capabilities, regulatory clarity, scalability, and other factors are in place, and there's every confidence it will be, because Web 2 is a 25-year cycle. It took 25 years to get to a level of maturity that we enjoy today. And we have no expectation that Web3 will happen any faster than that. In fact, it, it may take longer, particularly as you bridge and live in this Web 2.5 world for a period of time. So the, the um, space is still developing, <clears throat> but the orientation is post-crypto. The platform we believe that's going to monetize the next generation or the next level of investment in the Web3 infrastructure is the tokenization of private assets. There is $330 trillion in private real estate in the world. There's $90 trillion in private infrastructure in the world. There's $160 trillion of private debt in the world. There's 50 
$5 trillion in private company equity. There's over $600 trillion in assets that are not in the financial system. They're highly illiquid, not very serviceable, that are ready to come into the financial system to be regulated by, or to be serviced by regulated financial institutions. What will that do? That will materially expand the financial system. Because when you bring those assets in and they're used as collateral for uh, access to liquidity, you have to expand the, the monetary system. And it's backed by real world assets. We've published a report around the interest in private investments. A couple of data points. Wealth is held today 50-50 by institutions and individuals. However, investment in private assets today is 85% held by institutions. Individuals would like access to invest in these private assets for diversification and also because private investments have returned 5x public markets over the last 20 years. Based on our data, there's $8 trillion to $12 trillion in AUM positioned by private high net worth, ultra high net worth, and affluent uh, in, uh, uh, individuals to move into private investments of tokenized private assets. That eight to, eight to $12 trillion will be the mechanism by which the next level of development of this technology ecosystem is monetized, the deficiencies are addressed, new capabilities are introduced, and the evolution of the tech stack and the, and the re-expression of the financial market infrastructure will be realized. Interesting stuff, right? So what he is, what he is making the argument for, that it's not about decentralization and crypto, that we're that we're moving past that, and we're moving to a world in which those who might look to be disintermediated will be able to participate because the plumbing will be addressed, that the regulation will be addressed. That the reg, you know, regulatory concerns, all of these things eventually can be addressed. What he's forgetting to, or what he fails to say is, the access is not changed. Changing the plumbing doesn't necessarily change access. Eighty-five percent institution, fifteen percent uh, regular investors that are accredited investors leaves a lot of people out of the game. So he's not addressing that. It's very, very interesting that he talks about collateral and, and it's liquidity. The, auto market, the automated market maker from uh, uh, the, uh, on the XRPL, coming to the XRPL is gonna be a game changer in a lot of different ways. Everybody's sleeping, I think, on the fact, besides Mickey B. Fresh, is that everybody's sleeping on the fact that there will not be an accredited investor to the XRPL. You and I will be able to participate in a system where institutions will be participate. They will be there. They will be participating. It's always going to be about access. It's always going to be about access. I put this out, this post out. I, I just, I, it's, it's something interesting for me. And um, I, I, I quoted uh, something that Jefferson kind of quoted. He didn't, a lot of stuff was kind of taken out of context a little bit. But in any case, wonder what Jefferson would think of BlackRock. I, I said, wonder what Jefferson would think of BlackRock. Vanguard, State Street, and Ripple. Here's a quote. If the American people ever allow private banks to control the issue of their currency, first by inflation, then by deflation, the banks and corporations that will grow up around will deprive the people of all property BlackRock, Vanguard, State Street, 88% of the S&P, 88%. 
the banks and corporations that will grow up around will deprive the people of all their property until their children wake up homeless on the continent their fathers conquered. The issuing power should be taken from the banks and restored to the people to whom it properly belongs. I sincerely believe that banking establishments are more dangerous than standing armies and that the principles of spending money to be paid by posterity under the name of funding is but swindling futurity on a large scale. Someone commented on the, my post and said, what has Ripple got to do with the big three? And I said, still figuring that out, bro. All right, guys, listen, this wraps up your XRP Ripple daily news in around zero to 10 minutes. I hope it has been valued to you, valuable to you. If it has, do me a favor, hit that like button. And if you've been hanging out, listen to the Crypto Siege, please consider subscribing to the channel. And don't forget to ring that notification bell so that you know whenever we go live or whenever we upload a video. I would remind each and every one of you to live permissionless because old money doesn't want you to win. But that's okay, though, because you and I, we're already winning. I'll talk to you soon, guys. See ya.